So as we continue with our look through osteopathic history in the form of this essentially method that's guided by textual analysis, although it is not uh, traditional textual analysis as you would see it in a research setting or a research journal because this is obviously done through an audiovisual medium. But what we want to look at is just our quick review before we get into this particular author, which is John Mark Littlejohn. We want to just remind you that epistemology is a theory of knowledge or a theory of knowledge creation. The questions that are often asked in relation to it is of what can be known, who can it be known by, and how can it be known. We have a breakdown of epistemologies of positivism, so one singular reality that can be identified through appropriate experimentation. Post-positivism, there is a singular reality that can be identified with multiple forms of experimentation, but the researcher does bring issues and needs to be, you need to attempt to control for. So post-positivism, you're not as likely to find that singular reality, but you'll get close to it. Constructivism, there are multiple realities entirely dependent on the individual environment of observation and previous experience of the individual. So that's your epistemology review. Ontology is a classification system. So philosophically, it is the study of reality. What is real? You have the bifurcation of ideas of the most real or objects of the most real. And then in science or the scientific sphere, ontology is your classification system. How do you classify reality? What categories do you use to describe reality? Axiology is the value or the values judgments of the researcher. In this case, it will be the authors of the text that we're looking at. So once again, before we get into our current author, we go through a general review of the themes or the emergent themes and trying to figure out if they hold steady. And again, so far they are more or less. No consistent epistemology, so no consistent, no singular epistemology may be a better way to say it. There is some consistency in how they're developing knowledge and the fact that they're being inconsistent in how they're identifying, claiming, truth, knowledge, things of that nature. Uh, as far as ontology, functional anatomy and the laws of nature. So functional anatomy is the way to identify the laws of nature or functional anatomy is the way to interpret how the laws of nature are playing out within your patient or within your subject. So that seems to be pretty stable as far as how they're classifying reality. Individual empiricism, so I can identify it as the individual looking, that's holding pretty stable. Uh, what I see, what I find, that's the truth, right? That's, that's what's real. There is still prejudice towards other healthcare systems. That seems to be, again, holding stable. Some authors a little bit more, some a little bit less prejudiced against other existing healthcare systems. And then also a high degree of certainty in objectively uncertain circumstances. Again, to be fair, the manner in which we can be more, the manner in which we can be objective today when looking back on this, we can say that those circumstances were uncertain. However, at the time, the degree of certainty that they, these osteopathic authors displayed is not unreasonable, it's not unfair. However, that needs to be tempered with our ability to look back on it. So again, high degree of certainty. However, we understand that their certain level of certainty shouldn't have been as high as it is with what we know now, with what they knew then. It's not unfair, the degree of certainty that they displayed. So before getting into the particular text that we've chosen in relation to the author that we're looking at this time in John Martin Little John, we'll just go through a few general kind of overarching stories. Now there are, in my experience, unclear stories surrounding John Martin Little John. John Martin Little John is a very big deal in the United Kingdom because he is the individual who essentially started the first school of osteopathy in the United Kingdom, in, in England specifically. The particular history of that I'm not necessarily going to go through, but just understand that Little John was a big deal as far as actually being the figurehead of importing the practice of osteopathy to England. 
So he's a big deal in England. He's much less of a big deal in other places around the world that practice osteopathy, unless the primary transmission route of osteopathy was from the UK, but with hands-on practitioners from the UK to a new country, or what you'll see is in subgroups within a given country that have been more influenced by those from the UK, then they'll speak about Little John quite a bit. You, Little John is not much of a character in the development of osteopathy in places where the UK's had a smaller influence. It doesn't mean that Little John wasn't an important figure, it just means that the discussion of Little John as somebody who was important in the past varies location to location based on transmission route. Right, so he did found the, he was part of the founding of the Chicago School of Osteopathy. He did find, or found, he was a founder of the British School of Osteopathy. Now the thing that's interesting about Little John is that some people laud him, but other people don't see him as being as valuable as, as others. His credentials, right, he had quite a few credentials before going, entering the American School of Osteopathy, and his credentials seem to be dubious in their nature. So some of them may have just been awarded to him where he said he earned them, but they were just given to him some maybe he didn't even earn or he wasn't even awarded properly. That's a little bit besides the point with him as an individual as far as his value within the profession is concerned. His credentials being dubious doesn't change the fact that he was the primary transmission route for osteopathy as a hands-on profession to end up in England or to end up in the UK, and then the subsequent spread from there. So he does have value despite the dubious nature of his credentials and also some of his personal behaviors, right? So those things don't negate the value that he brings in spreading the profession around the world. So considering that the general framework that I'm using to undertake this project when looking at historical osteopathic texts in the form of a textual analysis, and considering that that is more so on the constructivist end of methods, right? So that means that the reality that's being presented here does depend on me, my previous experiences, and my environment of observation. So just understanding that I am a part of this, I my views, my experiences, do influence not only how I'm seeing this, but what I'm saying. So in saying that, the two texts that we're looking at here are Principles of Osteopathy. Now the un this has an unclear publishing date, but avail it is available from the Museum of Osteopathic History uh, online. And then also the Theory of Treatment of the Spine, right? So those two texts. So Little John work online that is somewhat difficult to find. It's not impossible, it's somewhat difficult to find. So what I've chosen is things that are fairly easy to find and to go back to the nature of this being constructivist in methodology this project i just want to let you know that for myself attempting to read little john's work it essentially feels like pulling teeth from an angry hippopotamus it's not an easy thing to do it's quite verbose in my analysis or in my viewpoint and other people may feel differently and other people may have particular points that they'd like to raise in relation to that comment, but I just want you to know that it's it, that it's quite long, it's quite verbose, it's uh, fairly technical as well. That doesn't mean anything good or bad with it, but when you're trying to pull a point out, it takes a long time, which is why I say it feels like pulling teeth from an angry hippopotamus. So the first quote we're going to look for from the Principles of Osteopathy is as follows. These scattered references to history will make plain that many of the fundamental principles of the osteopathic science were developed by predecessors, just as anatomical facts were brought out by anatomists of past ages. Even when the principles were developed, however, their application was not understood or was misinterpreted. The facts, namely the knowledge was there in the anatomical, physiological, and pathological fields, but the practical application was absent. Hence, we must recognize that the work of Dr. Still 
was not in reality the discovery of osteopathy, but the discovery of a single scientific fact, namely, disease is the result of physiological discord in the functioning of the organs or, or parts of the physiological laboratory of life. The cause of disease can be traced to bony variations from the base of the skull to the bottom of the foot in the joints of the cervical, dorsal, and lumbar vertebrae. The articula articulations with the sacrum also the arms and lower limbs. So the main point of this quote is to say that the observations that can be claimed to be under the osteopathic umbrella were not new as far as knowledge in the general world was concerned, but what to do with those pieces of knowledge, the synthesis of that knowledge, the, the idea that treatment can be generated, or hands-on treatment especially, can be generated from these pieces of knowledge, was not necessarily in existence until Dr. Still came and essentially noted that the physiological discord or the relationship of health and disease states to the mechanical functioning of the body, that concept wasn't synthesized well. So he's giving credit to Dr. Still for that. Now, I will note that Dr. Still and Dr. Littlejohn did seem to have some personal strife, uh, neither here nor there, but the idea that is present here is that these pieces of information were all known, but not synthesized. It was Dr. Still that synthesized them. And in that synthesis, you're seeing some call to individual empiricism. So Dr. Still noticed this. So everybody else kind of noticed these things. Dr. Still pulled them together, and then he noticed this thing, and then he was able to use his hands, move things around, and that seemed to improve health states. Then also the idea that the ontology, that the that functional anatomy is the way to interpret things is also contained within this quote. So our second quote from Little John from The Principles of Osteopathy is really going to give us at least some initial insight into his view of other healthcare practices, right? So he's, we'll just preface it by saying he's somewhat softer than other, other writers on other healthcare pra practices within the field of osteopathy. So the quote in the application of the principle of adjustment was found necessary to normalize the structure. Following this septic, toxic, and other conditions were found which prevented normalizing structure from expressing the vital forces characteristic of the organism. Hence we find these toxic, septic, and other conditions required to be removed in order to allow the structure to become fr the free expression of the vital forces. This does not mean that osteopathy or its principles should be mixed with any other method or system of therapeutics. The fact is that the principle of osteopathy cannot be combined with the principle or principles of other schools. The method of osteopathy is entirely different from the methods of other practitioners. At the same time, the dietetic, hygienic, and septic fields, there is common ground which must be covered by all schools. If any honest attempt is to be made to master disease and to remove it, osteopathy therefore stands on the basis of its fundamental principle. So the fundamental principle uh, he's referring to is essentially the, the relationship of alterations in mechanical function to health and disease states, right? The point to be drawn out here is he's saying that other, other healthcare practices will have crossover with osteopathy in the basics of health. So dietetics, so diet, hygiene, things of that nature. Everybody should some more or less agree on that. But as far as osteopathy is concerned, there's a separation because osteopathy holds the base principle that there are mechanical correlates to health and disease states. So if something's not moving particularly well within the body, that will then relate to the presentation of a patient with respect to their health or disease states. So that's where he's saying that the divergence is. So again, noting that it's not necessarily prejudicial in this quote from Little John, but when looking at other healthcare practices, saying that there is a divergence, we're different than them. Is, is what's contained here. Saying that there are some basics and good crossover, health, diet, things like that, 
again shows he's not hard on other healthcare practices necessarily, but he is saying osteopathic practitioners are different. So the next quote from the principles of osteopathy from Little John is quite long because it's essentially the, you know, a list of, it's, it's almost like the osteopathic platform. So not quite like Dr. Stills that, that he puts in research and practice that we didn't necessarily go over in our video on still, but this is a similar concept, right? So first, osteopathy is opposed to the use of everything that is foreign to the body, but as an organism and as a mechanism, whether found in this form of substances foreign to the proximate principles of the organism or in the form of methods antagonistic to the mechanics of the body. So basically no drugs is what little John is more or less saying there. If it's foreign to the body, don't use it. Generally speaking, he's saying he's anti-pharmaceutical. Two, osteopathy favors the use of every means that may be called native to the body, both as an organism and a mechanism, and all the mechanical principles that are in harmony with the body mechanism. So if that science sort of pointing in the, gen in the general direction of what will become the concept of body is self-healing and self-regulating. Three, osteopathy recognizes the necessity of sanitative and hygienic measures to prevent the spread of disease and to make health most agreeable to those enjoying only a partial measure, measure of health. So a major part of maintaining and promoting health, be clean is more or less what he's saying there. So the majority of major jumps in population level health seem to relate heavily to hygiene and sanitation. So sanitation being those things that are based on systems, right? So government run systems, hygiene being more personal. Uh, for osteopathy does not believe in the use of foreign serums, foreign cultures of virus, toxins, or other disease substances, just as the, it does not believe in the injection of blood because Every such subject required by the body is manufactured in the individual body and if not so manufactured within the body it represents a foreign substance which the body itself must remain in order to be of any service to that body. So essentially no injection. So this is no pharmacy, no vaccine, more or less. I'm not 100% sure in specific terms as to Little John's developed stance on vaccines. Um, it's probably one of those ones where if you were to take Little John out of his time, he may change his opinion. I'm not gonna make a firm claim on that, but what I am going to say here, he's noting don't inject things. Also, if you are injecting things, if it was gonna work, the body has to be in good working condition mechanically, otherwise it can't really take it on. So forget the pharmaceuticals because if the body was working right, it would produce it by itself. And if you give the pharmaceutical and the body's not working right, it's not gonna use it right, is essentially the argument being presented there. Five, osteopathy believes in operative surgery as a last resort when some portion or portions of the mechanism become a hazard to organic life. Sorry, I may have read, misread one of those words, but organic life. The final test then for operative surgery osteopathically must be hazard to the body life. Surgery is identical in basis then with osteopathy and not a coordinating system. The surgical principle according to osteopathy is not a, the problem of the removal of the organ or the removal of a part of the structure of the body, but it is the removal of, of a part or organ that has become dangerous to the body and it is to preserve the organic life that the part or organ is removed. So something that's in you that's not functioning properly that is becoming dangerous, so let's just say an organ has some form of rupture and it's going to become septic, well, that might kill you, cut it out, more or less. So he's saying that osteopathy, so surgery in relation to osteopathy is an extension of osteopathy, which is something that Dr. Still said, that again, that we didn't particularly cover when we talked about Still, but that is something that was said by Still. So they're pretty much in line there. Uh, six, osteopathy takes its stand on the principle that the etiology of disease is to be traced to the abnormal adjustment of the anatomical, physiological, and environmental conditions of the organism, that to sure the disease, the cause or causes, 
must be removed by the substitution of normal for abnormal adjustment of the structure of functioning and environment. So when little John's speaking about the, the normalization of structure, he may be broadly speaking about normal motion, normal shape, right? So that's the surgical deal where if it's an abnormal shape, we may have to cut it. Or if there's an abnormal growth, we may have to cut it. Uh, where adjustment won't do it, right? So making it move better won't do it because there's this growth, right? So that's where surgery is concerned and uh, normal environment, that's where he's going to relate to hygiene, sanitation, and diet, right? So he is fairly in line with Dr. Still on these claims in these ways, but basically saying things that then in future turn into body self-healing, self-regulating, right? So don't put anything in it, and if you were to put anything in it, it, if the body's not adjusted properly, not functioning properly, the drugs are kind of useless because it can't use them anyway. So we still have this belief in functional anatomy being the way to interpret health and disease states, mechanical correlates to health and disease. So that becomes something that's showing up again in this particular set of quotes. So our next quote from the Principles of Osteopathy from John Martin Littlejohn is going to give us some a little bit more insight into the views or the opinion on other healthcare practices and also he's going to directly mention the concept of truth. So when he directly mentions the concept of truth then we need to start to consider the concept of epistemology and we can then map that. So the quote goes as follows, we fail to to see the logic of the situation. Allopaths have not a mono not monopoly on facts. Induction is all right, but if facts simply rest on probability, such a probability can never evolve by logical methods, a universal principle, such as must be evolved if allopathy represents modern scientific medicine. So just generally speaking, we'll pause there for a moment. Somewhat more adversarial than we saw previously with respect to other healthcare practices. In this particular case, we're talking about medical doctors or allopaths. So we'll go back to the quote. Newton was one of the first great scientists of nature from the particular in well-authenticated cases, he reached to the laws of nature. Other schools of medicine have experimental facts and these, they have been what are called tenets. It is satisfactory, it is a satisfactory piece of information to gather that regulars have no tenets. So regulars being allopaths. Truth is truth, however long it may have lain buried in. I don't, I can't see the word properly, but basically, truth is truth, no matter how long it has lain in the annals of the ages. Ages, I believe it's annals. I may be wrong on that. The great truth, facts of anatomy and physiology are not probable truths, but certainties. And those principles that are based upon the truth facts are scientific principles. An accidental falling apple evolved the great laws of nature and gravitation. May not the same accidental experience untold of un, untold great laws in nature in the nature of man. So just kind of going through that quote, truth is truth, right? So he's not necessarily associating a specific epistemological approach or truth building approach with that quote. He's just saying it's true, but the fact that he says truth is truth no matter how long it's been laying around in history, so something's been identified and nobody paid attention to it, it's been there. What he's essentially espousing there is a positivist worldview. There is an obligate reality that no matter who looks at it, it's there and it's stable, right? And he's also talking about building knowledge with respect to varying angles here. So other healthcare practices, uh, allopathic physicians, he is talking about the building of truth, but he's saying that they're building it on probabilities, right? So they've got tenets because they're building probabilities, right? So something comes in, it's probably this, right? I'm looking at these lists of symptoms, it's probably condition A. Well, 
It's almost all these symptoms. However, one of these symptoms is a little, little bit different, so it's probably not A now, it's probably B. That's pro likely what he's pointing to in this. The discovery over time of anatomical and physiological certainties are what he's saying he's basing it on. So he's saying that there's enough agreement and that anatomy can always be trusted. Unfortunately, so this is where the highly certain, high degree of certainty in uncertain circumstances comes in. Unfortunately, it is very easy to observe that anatomy is not always the same between individuals. A simple way to view this is situs inversus. Now they would have known about situs inversus through or flipping of organs from one side to the other based on autopsy, but in a living specimen, unless you have an image, you can't tell that that's there. So they knew, and they also know from dissection and from surgical procedures, that not all arteries branch the same, that there are normal variations in arteries, that there are normal variations from side to side between a person. Anatomy is not perfectly symmetrical. Anatomy is not always the same. There's a general schematic that you can draw, and that's what most people learn is the general schematic of anatomy. But it's not always the same individual to individual, so he's saying these are certain, but they're not certain. Anatomy actually does behave as a probability because it's probably like this, but it also may not be, is a way to frame it. So he's being very much a positivist and saying we're better positivists as osteopathic practitioners because the medical practitioners are working on probabilities and likelihoods. We're working on certainties. But because we can look back at this and we understand even things that they did understand at the time, that anatomy is not as certain as one might claim, that he's being very certain in uncertain circumstances. So once again, considering what John Martin Littlejohn is saying about certainty or the certainty of anatomy, we find another quote, right? So you're looking at essentially his claim to be a good positivist, but maybe not doing what he thinks he's doing. Diagnosis, the keynote. In the, in the system, there is one physical and anatomical and Physiological diagnosis, this will always be the groundwork of the osteopathic system. It is based upon an absolute certain knowledge of the ar structure, architectural technique, and functional activity of the body and of its part parts. In this diagnosis, we gladly accept the help of the pa of palpation, percussion, auscultation, chemical, and microscopical aids in the analysis of the secretions and excretions of the body. So absolute certain knowledge of the structure, so absolute certain knowledge of anatomy. You can have a very good schem schematic of anatomy, but there are certain things that are obscured from you in a living specimen, in somebody who is not wide open, who hasn't been cut open, who doesn't have trauma and is open, but even then things are different as they present because that's not what anatomy normally looks like or behaves like. That's abnormal because it's traumatic and an injury. The archi architectural technique and functional activity, the thing that we are aware of, and they likely would have been aware of, but maybe they weren't applying methods to highlight this, but if you're looking at assays of excretions or assays of like so something under a microscope or something from uh, a fluid sample, be it blood or, or spit or some other fluid, that there are ranges, there are what would be considered normal ranges of substances within each one of those things, and you can even be above or below those ranges and still be normal for you. So there's, we know in examining excretions and other things that variation is the norm. There are ranges that seem more normal than others and you can be outside of those ranges that can be normal for you. So he's saying absolute certainty with respect to physiology. Well, absolute certainty with respect to physiology means that you have to accept that there's a range. So he's being very certain in at least with respect to anatomy, an un unknowably uncertain thing at the time, and he's being very certain with respect to physiology, which likely they would have known that there were ranges, that not everybody had the same amount of stuff per unit in, in their blood compared to other people. So being very, very certain. The nice thing is that what he is saying is that he's looking for evidence, right? He's looking for evidence to understand what's going on, uh, and that evidence he's looking for in functional anatomy, more or less. Now, functional anatomy, you can argue, would include some form of physiological 
processes. So it depends on how you'd like to term that. But realistically, he is looking for evidence. He is trying to say, we rest on this foundation. So the ontology is present again because he's talking about functional anatomy. Now he's introducing a little bit more of a focus on physiology and the willingness to use means other than palpation. So things like uh, tissue, tissue samples. So again, we have a quote that discusses the concept of truth as well as the concept of surgery. So the relationship to other professions is noted here as well. So turning to the quote, this reform was to be developed on a scientific basis for osteopathy is scientific if it is truth because science is knowledge and truth. So this is an epistemological claim. So he's saying that osteopathy is based on science. It's based on observable things. Now he's making a call to being based on anatomy, physiology, more or less, and those certain facts and those certain things, and that's where he's developing it. So you can see that he's making the claim that the ontology or the view of reality, that functional anatomy is the way that the laws of nature are expressed, that seems consistent between the authors that we've looked at so far, including Little John, that he's making his epistemological claim. So he's building off of those blocks of reality through functional anatomy. So that's how he's claiming that the osteopathic epistemology is built. But we can still see the way that he's talked about the building of truth, that he's being very certain in somewhat uncertain circumstances. So he's being somewhat consistent in his epistemological approach, but He's doing it, what I would say, is poorly, especially as we can look at it retrospectively. So we go back to the quote. At first, it was only applied to chronic conditions, and many thought there was found the limit of, of its usefulness. But that system, which began with the blood and nerve force as the warp and woof of life, as the basis of vital existence and the anatomical and physiological integrity of tissue structures and organs, could not rest in its progressive development short of embracing the entire art of healing. Osteopathy is anti-knife because it loudly protests against the indiscriminate use of operative surgery, especially the butcher type. But the osteopathic principle which we laid down, the self-sufficiency of the organism of and in itself as a self recuperative mechanism, recognizing that when traumatic conditions produce a solution of continu continuity in the osseous, ligamentous, and muscular structures, there must be a method of repair founded upon mechanical and physiological principles. So the relationship to other professions, he's saying that the allopaths are essentially butchers, that they'll just cut anything, whereas the osteopath will use surgery when there's a disruption to the continuity of tissues, right? So if something's ripped, torn, broken, they would use surgery at that point. And also, if, well, likely, if there was what could be deemed an abnormal growth, you'd cut it out. The this is very similar again to what Still said. Still did talk about surgery as an extension of the of osteopathy, uh, and being different than allopathic surgery. So he was essentially setting it up as this is this does make sense within this osteopathic umbrella that we've set forth, but it's different than allopathic surgery. So again, you're getting that somewhat prejudicial view between pre-existing healthcare professions. And you're also seeing that the epistemological claim, the knowledge building claim is we're building it on these facts, right? These definite certainties of anatomy and physiology when if they were looking at appropriately, even at the time it was observable that although anatomy and physiology give you really good schematics, there's differences between individuals. So anatomy and physiology, if you were to map it onto on epistemology that we've discussed, it would basically be post-positivist, right? So there is, there is an underlying reality with respect to anatomy and physiology. However, there's differences. It's not always the same, and it can't always be found immediately, especially with respect to external work, right? So working hands-on on the outside of a living body, there's a lot of stuff that's obscured for you, from you. So there is an absolute underlying reality within that individual body, but you don't know if it's the same or different from previous bodies, right? So you have obscured information. So he's making the best way to describe what he could be doing 
is he's trying to be a positivist, but really, realistically, what he's claiming or what he's looking at with functional anatomy and physiology being the basis of the epistemology or the basis of how things can be known, it really should be more, or there's a better argument for it to be post-positivist in, in its nature. So he's being a positivist, but maybe he'd be better off being a post-positivist. So now we switch texts with respect to John Mark Littlejohn and we look at uh, the theory of the treatment of the spine. Now this is an article, this isn't necessarily a full book, but this is drawn from an article. So it is important to reason out the philosophy of our system of treatment. True therapeutics must be scientific and philosophic. In saying this we mean that therapy must conform to the science and structure uh, of the structure and functions of the organism and to the philosophy of vitality revealed in the vital mechanism and its life phenomena. The osteopathic system is based on the fundament of the nervous system. The framework of the body is simply a piece of vitalized machinery, constructed for the manifestation of nervous and mental life, and used as a medium of the expression of the deeper life forces. These life force forces must come to the front if our system is to be deemed of value." So he's building an argument to build reality, or a view on reality, what is real. Uh, he's building an argument, what can be known, how can it be known. So he's using the ontology or the system of classification, aka functional anatomy, as expressing, and in Little John's case, physiology, functional anatomy and physiology expressing the laws of nature. So that's the that's the ontological concept, the classification system. That then generates the epistemology. That then generates these are the scientific facts. These are the things that we can definitely know, and we can build on these. So this quote gives us both. It gives us a union of the view of reality and the view of knowledge and how to build that in essentially one quote. So he's, he's more or less presenting as a positivist and his ontology is functional anatomy and in the case of Little John, he's relying a little bit more on, on physiology as well. So we look at a quote from the theory of the treatment of the spine from Little John again. Spinal cord and disease conditions. Now the old idea held by some from the osteopathic standpoint that was that most diseases, if not all diseases, originated in connection with the sympathetic system and that all treatment must be directed through the sympathetic system. That is not correct because we found before for, from the subject of embryology that the spinal cord is the great objective point where all diseases are likely to originate either in origin or in expression. And that is true in connection with all diseases, so that the great objective point will not be the sympathetic system, but the spinal cord, which is the cerebrospinal nervous system. Now, I don't know if this is a typo or if this is something that actually occurred in the in the original article, because the form that I find it in is not the form of the original article, so I don't know if there was a copy and paste problem, because this looks like it was retyped. But subsequent to that portion, he goes on to retype the quote that we did just a moment ago. Right? It's important to reason out the philosophy of our system of treatment through therapeutics must be scientific and philosophic, on and so forth. So if that was actually in the original article, that unfortunately reinforces my feeling that reading Little John's like trying to pull teeth from an angry hippopotamus because you already said that, why are you saying it again? Why is it so disorganized? Why is it so hard to find? Things of that nature. That's a small aside. But to go to now the old idea held by some from the osteopathic standpoint, uh, the disease are sympathetic. Well, he's like, no, they're cerebrospinal, right? Because the sympathetic system is part of the cerebrospinal system. And there's this weird argument happening here, not necessarily in plain sight, but you can, if you have previous information, so again, this is somewhat of a constructivist thing whereby my previous understanding does matter to how I'm going to interpret this, how I'm going to look at this. But the sympathetic system and the cerebrospinal system as far as physical location are quite proximate, also both out of direct reach of an osteopathic practitioner, unless somebody happens to be cut open or traumatically open. Uh, if you can ever see a sympathetic ganglion in today's world, 
make sure that you call an ambulance that person's in real trouble. But the idea that the way into these things is to move the bones of the vertebral column. So if you're moving the bones of the vertebral column and that's how you're treating the sympathetic system, well, if you're moving the bones of the vertebral column, you can then make the argument that you're treating the cerebrospinal system. So it's this weird argument happening here. But again, he's saying he's making a positivistic claim, but he's also noting the development of the knowledge, how the knowledge is being built through experience. So you can make some connection to that being through individual empiricism, or you could make it being more collective empiricism, but the observation over time does matter. Now that is a good way to build knowledge, is to iterate, to start from start again from the new point, right? So you learn thing one, so you kind of go up, and you start again from that up point. Now, even if that's not correct, you're still going along in the process of learning. That's an iterative approach. But the, you know, the, he's making this firm claim, but he's also saying from embryology, we know that it's most likely that diseases originate in the cerebrospinal system. So firm claim, but he's still kneecapping it a little bit. He's still kind of cutting it off at the knees by saying most likely. So showing some uncertainty in the way that it's spoken, but still essentially conveying a fair amount of certainty. So continuing with the theory of treatment of the spine, we find this quote, articulation of the spine for coordination. In addition to that, every treatment that is directed through cerebrospinal system reacts upon the body through the sympathetic system. So you just kind of go back to the previous quote. He's saying that, well, if you treat the cerebrospinal system, it's going to get the sympathetic system anyways. They're united, right? That's essentially what he's saying here, or in that particular sentence. Hence, one of the strongest treatments that can be given from an osteopathic standpoint is what is called articulating the spinal vertebrae. That is done by taking each one of the vertebrae down along the spine and moving it. There's a certain degree of mobility in every one of these spinal vertebrae in some more than in others, but there's a certain degree of mobility in every one of the vertebrae and in articulating the vertebrae, we directly affect the spinal cord. Now, the cerebrospinal system is the great center of reflex and autonomic activities. Here we include the medulla, which is really the spinal bulb, and that means in relation to the entire organism so that if you articulate the spinal column and in that way appeal to the spinal cord, you are appealing to the body through the sympathetic system. In other words, establishing order through the great control, the great central nervous system, which has a control of order in the body organism. Essentially what he's saying, no matter what's going on, just move all the vertebrae and that's going to deal with a bunch of stuff because that's a great coordinating center. So the assumption is that free mobility of a vertebral union or of vertebral joints, free mobility or as much as can be expected, is going to be the sign of health and limited mobility is going to be the sign of disease. So if there's limited mobility and this holds true or this holds useful, move the bone a little bit more and then that should allow it to control. So essentially he's saying instead of, because instead of grabbing the cord itself, move the box it's in, move the bones it's in, and that gives you your direct access, even though it is obviously observably indirect access because you're moving things from the outside. You're not even directly moving the bones. You're moving from the outside to the inside. It would be the argument. So he's saying you have direct control over this coordination by making sure you move the bone. So basically he's like, well, what do we do about condition A, B, C, D, E, F, whatever you want to talk about? Little John's answer is, as far as the spine's concerned, move them all, right? It's a, just a very generalized approach. Just move them all and that'll create the coordination. But the assumption is that free mobility of the vertebral joints means health. Limited mobility means disease. There's no inclusion of the reality that through a lifespan, there's ossification of varying tissues throughout the vertebral column, whereby you lose mobility. And it happens at varying stages for varying people for varying reasons. So this unfortunately doesn't hold as true as you would like because people are different. They lose mobility at different rates, which is normal across a lifespan. So he's making this argument that Free vertebral joints is health. Limited motion vertebral joints is disease. Just move it, just move them all, right? That's his answer. So 
somewhat dubious in what we understand today, but to little John, obviously, this was clear. So this is a fairly long quote, but I do want to go through it because it's an early representation of some conceptual splits within the osteopathic profession. Again, not necessarily know, not necessarily everybody's going to know or have been exposed to the concepts in the way that I have or agree with me, and that's okay. But there's a little bit of a split between people who are more physiology and more anatomy, right, within the profession. You can draw that as a broad bifurcation. So you see a little bit of dissent beginning with the first osteopathic book through Elmer Barber where he was essentially saying that still didn't figure anything out necessarily. He just was more organized in his approach. So you see some dissent there and that not everything was subluxation uh, or, or I don't remember the particular term off the top of my head, but essentially dislocation. So I believe that's the proper term that Barber was saying that not everything was a dislocation. Not necessarily subluxation, but not everything was a dislocation. More often than not, it was just tight muscles, and then still was more along the lines of dislocation. So here we have this long quote that I'll go through in just a second, but showing the seeds of the split between people who are more about anatomy and more about physiology within the profession. So the law of physiological physics. Now, in some regard, this is the only field there is in osteopathic in the osteopathic method of treatment, that is to say, primitive osteopathy was the osteopathy of osseous lesions, and it was supposed that in the correction of these osseous lesions, we had all there was in all the osteopathic system. Hence, we have been called bone setters and bone uh, and bone manipulator, and such names as these, which in a sense are quite correct, if that is the view, but that is not the complete osteopathic system. So, he's noting that he first of all he uses primitive osteopathy, so those old osteopaths. So he he learned osteopathy was introduced in and around 1898-1899 if memory serves me properly. So he's saying those people a few years before me in 1892 and between now and then, very primitive. We've come so far in eight to ten years, right? That's essentially what's being stated here. To go back to the quote, the principles that are applied here are physical principles, that is in treatment I mean. The principles that are applied in the correction of lesions, the different physical lesions, are physical principles. They are not, however, the law of pure physics. They are what we call physiological physics. Now that side of physiological physics is a very big one, and of course, we cannot go into it as we might. The law of physiological physics are to be applied to the body. In fact, the body cannot get along unless these physiological principles are in operation. The blood as a circulatory system depends upon physical laws. The heart, for example, represents two kinds of pumps, the force pump and the suction pump. The force pump on the one side of circulation and the arterial side of circulation and the suction pump on the venous side of circulation. So just to pull out of the quote for a moment, that may not be as accurate as he liked to claim it. There's the you, you can make the argument of some form of suction uh, in relation to change in partial pressure within the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity. You could also make the argument that it's more so about the movement of the diaphragm and the pumping of the diaphragm on the inferior vena cava. So there's a few things there that's not as accurate as one would like it to be. It's not complete, but it's a, maybe a good heuristic, a good rule of thumb. Uh, so again, that just allows me to point to high degree of certainty in claim in somewhat uncertain circumstances because we've learned more about how the arterial or the venous side works, especially with respect to the inferior and superior vena cava between when this was written and now. In the circulatory system, we have the laws of blood pressure, which are simply the laws of fluid pressure in an elastic tubular system. Then we have the laws and the principles of tension, arterial tension especially, which represents simply the principles of extensibility and elasticity. So he's again talking rule of thumb, so being very broad, there are more particular things. One such particular thing is that, uh, if I remember correctly, that blood cannot be, is considered a non-Newtonian fluid, so it doesn't necessarily follow the laws of Newtonian mechanics 
right? I, which I am not an expert in, but it's just, it, blood doesn't act the way you would think it would if you looked at other fluids, right? So to come back to the quote, on the venous side of the blood, we have muscular force to help propel forward blood, which would not remove, which would not move were it not for that muscular force. Adding that mus muscular force as an accessory, we have valvular system of the venous blood vessels. There are no valves in the arterial blood system proper. The, vi the valves are found only on the venous side. Why? Because the blood has to flow through vessels that are not elastic, and hence the pressure must come from behind the blood and from before the blood. The blood moves in sections or in segments, and because the blood move in segments from one valve to another valve represents a blood segment on the venous side. Now, these are laws and principles that, that every practitioner knows, even if he does not apply them. Take the big field of chronic endocarditis. Now, what is the primary cause of endo chronic endocarditis? Some men may say that it is a germ. Other, another man may say that it is something else, but the primary cause of chronic endocarditis is the physical cause. And what is it? It is a change in the arterial tension due to the fact that the constrictor influence is cut off or exaggerated in connection with the arterial blood vessels and the only possible way to correct that condition is to correct the tension and to correct the constrictor influence which lies beyond the tension or behind the tension now lots of words big long quote he made a lot of assumptions a lot of jumps the idea that blood moves in segments not absolutely true right so it depends on how you're looking at it blood flow we now know is primarily locally auto regulated the caliber of vessels does seem to come from multiple areas in the cerebrum or in the brain so the caliber the general caliber within the system seems to be controlled up top but blood flow is more locally auto regulated which he is not necessarily displaying an understanding of in this quote he's saying that you know endocarditis or swelling in and around the heart uh, may be from a germ but you know some people may say that but really it's got to be mechanical so he would make the he'd likely be a person to make the argument that even if there was a germ the only reason the germ could take hold is because the mechanics were wrong right so he's saying the cause is definitely the mechanics now there has been no work done which attempted to falsify this claim by little john he just says well it has to be this because it's the laws of physics especially as present in the expression of physiology so functional anatomy as an expression of the law the, the laws of nature in this case he's leaning on physics so just keep in mind lots of assumptions there but you've got this idea that he's really setting up the break between the people who are more about physiology and the more people who are more about anatomy right so he's essentially sowing the seeds that can show where that started where that break in the profession started So the final quote we're going to get into from Little John is another long one. So we'll read through it and we'll probably break out as we go through the quote. But the, the th thing that's of great interest to foreshadow what we're going to talk about just through this quote is that all these fancy big words, physiological physics, coordinating the cerebral spinal system, he here gives you a method to do that, which is quite straightforward in an actual practice. So that's just essentially your foreshadowing, but we'll go to the quote. Hence the first great primary treatment from the osteopathic standpoint in correcting those reflex disturbances to co-opt the operative activities of the spinal cord and the sympathetic system. Now that is the reason why we speak so often of constitutional spinal treatment. What does constitutional spinal treatment consist of? The constitutional spinal treatment consists in the first place of correcting muscular, osseous, or articular lesions that are found along the spine. Secondly, the relaxation of the muscles if they are contracted the tonic contraction of the muscles if they are relaxed, and the trophic upbuilding of the muscles if they are in atrophic or badly nourished or debilitated condition. That is the second point. So he's the muscles are the wrong tone. They're either shrinking, atrophied, they're hard, or they're soft. Either way, you got to get them just right. So it's like a Goldilocks concept that he's talking about here. Back to the quote. Third point, the stimulation of the spine from the suboccipital region down to the coccyx on both sides.
Now the best method of doing that, as I have, I have it in experience, individual empiricism, all right, so back to the quote, is first of all to take the finger and the thumb, the patient lying on the face, and begin at the suboccipital region, putting the finger on the side of the spinous process and the thumb on the other side of the spinal process processes. Then moving the fingers gradually down along the spine of the coccyx. After that, do up to the occiput again and come down faster. The first was a slow movement along the spine, and the next take the fingers in the same way and push them deeply on the other side of the spinous processes between the bodies of the vertebrae. Of course you understand that that what that will mean in connection with the heads of the ribs, but that is why in which it is applied the, all the way down the spine. Following, Follow that by placing the patient on the side, and I have found the best results by always putting the patient first on the left side. And I cannot tell you why, but that is a matter of experience, individual empiricism. Back to the quote. Putting the patient first on the left side and then begin at the cervical region and take the two hands, put the two hands on the muscles as close to the spinous processes as you can get to the tips of the fingers and pull the muscles out straight out from the spinous processes and move them upward. Do that all the way down along the spine to the coccyx. Do the same thing on the other side. Turn the patient on the right side and do the same thing along the left side of the spine. That is what we call the constitutional treatment. That is the treatment for coordinating the three spinal and sympathetic systems. Now in all reflex disturbances, as I have said, that is the treatment. It does not make any difference if it may be located in the heart, lungs, liver, or any place else. Later on we will find this. there is a specific treatment going with that for the particular organ, but that is the treatment along the way, all the way through, and that is the reason I mention it now. So, to go back to what I said earlier, Little John, as far as he's concerned with respect to coordinating the cerebrospinal system and the sympathetic system, all this reflex coordination jazz, he's saying, first, do this up and down the spine. Slow, slow, fast. Put them on their left side, I don't know why, seems to work real good. And then just pull on their muscles, pull the erector mass away from the, vertebra from the vertebrae. Put them on the right side, do that. What I have noticed is that people that I've heard talk about Little John quite a bit actually put this left side first, right side after, into their treatments. Now they don't necessarily, in my personal experience, specifically do this by pulling on the, on the muscle mass, on the erector mass. Usually it's some other stuff going on before that. That's neither here nor there, but I have seen people who talk about Little John a lot go left side, right side on the side. So that is of some interest only on account of the fact that they may be carrying through from this particular point or maybe other written points where he talks about that. But how he figured out left side, left, right side, I don't know. It seems to work. Don't know why. Individual empiricism. High degree of certainty in an uncertain circumstance. But basically he's just saying all these fancy words, all you need to do is saw, get the muscles the right tone. He doesn't necessarily talk about in this quote that I pulled out, how to get an atrophied muscle back to a non-atrophied state or a nourished state, or how to get a soft muscle to be firm or a hard muscle to be soft, he just says pull on. So he says that those are things that you want to pay attention to, but he doesn't necessarily tell you how to do them. It doesn't mean he never told you how to do them, it means in this written section it's not said. But basically, just move them all boys, doesn't matter what it is, just move them all. So after looking at the quotes that have been pulled out of the work of Little John that we've examined here already, we want to consider emergent themes again. So in considering emergent themes, what we're starting to do is consider whether or not the themes seem to be stable between the authors that we've looked at. So the emergent themes seem to be quite similar. The inconsistent epistemology, especially between people, right? Little John seems to want to be a positivist, but not necessarily be a good one. He's trying to say that there's a distinct underlying reality that can always be identified and always be trusted in the form of anatomy and physiology. However, observably, anatomy and physiology vary, so you can get a really good schematic, but there's differences. So he's somewhat consistent in that, but the way that knowledge has been built between these writers is inconsistent. So. He may show more consistency than the others, however, there's inconsistency between them. So that maintains itself pretty similar as far as ontology, functional anatomy, essentially being the display of the laws of nature, so that's what's real, right? That stays pretty much the same uh, as far as values, 
you know, the values of individual empiricism, the values of, you know, finding stuff, which relates more or less to individual empiricism, and also uh, prejudice towards other healthcare practices, those maintain themselves pretty stable. Now, as we noted early on, there is undercutting of Dr. Still as being unique outside of the connection of mechanical issues as the proposed cause of disease. So it's not, he's essentially saying Dr. Still didn't figure this out. It was already figured out. Dr. Still organized it and synthesized it. So as I noted, there was some personal strife between Still and Little John. Now the proposed new theme is there's general agreement on mechanical issues as important in disease processes with disagreement on specifics. So Little John is a little bit more interested in physiology to explain what's going on, but the methods are very similar. He does the same things, at least when you read what he says he physically does. Whereas other practitioners or other writers may be more interested in the anatomical finding. They may, their explanation may be a little bit more on anatomy. Little John agrees, anatomy matters, the actual motions of anatomy matters, it's important. However, he is attempting to make this idea more sophisticated as opposed to primitive, which he does say primitive, in that it's not just about the bones or the bony lesion, it's about the it's about the physiology, we just happen to identify it through the anatomy. So that's essentially your new proposed theme here. General agreement on the, on the mechanical side of it, but difference, differences with respect to actual specifics or explanations. They, they physically do the same things. All these authors would probably, if you watch them treat, look extremely similar in what they did, especially if you were observing without a knowledge of the intended meanings of specific motions. If you already know about osteopathy, that's going to color your vision of what you're observing. If you don't know anything about osteopathy, all these practitioners, all the writers that we've used so far, their treatments would probably look quite similar to one another to the untrained eye, which is actually of interest because you're not in previously informed uh, with preferences towards understanding in a certain way. You understand it just by observing. And if you didn't know what you were looking at, they'd probably look very similar. 